their idea was. See, because when you think of wreaths, you think of celebrations. You think about celebrating. Because there's so much about his life to celebrate about. And so that's what we're going to do today, is celebrate. And man, by looking at this room and seeing standing room only and people also in the fellowship hall, it's obvious that there is so much about his life to celebrate about. When you think of Reese, there's so many qualities, characteristics, and maybe even adjectives that you would use to describe he and his life. Reese was brilliant. In fact, I remember as an eighth grader helping him get ready to prepare his last leader speech. I was sitting across the table from him, and usually what I did is I would get a few ideas from our young people, then I would write the speech and then hand it to them later for them to memorize and to learn. And so I said, Reese, what is it that you want me to write for you? And he said, I don't. <laughs> I was like, well, buddy, we're doing it. He goes, no, I, I'm saying I'm going to write the speech. I was like, okay. Well, usually I just do it because you got a lie on your plate, and, you know, I feel, you know, I can do it for you if you want me to. He goes, no, I'll, I'll do it. I was like, okay. And so uh, a few days later, rolled around, and I went up to him, and I said, hey, how's that speech coming? Expecting him to say I hadn't started yet. He said, it's done. And so we went into a room, and he pulled out of his uh, back pocket four pages of notes that he had written. And it was absolutely beautiful. At even such a young age, he had an incredible ability to put what was in his mind onto a page and deliver it to other people. But not only was Reese brilliant, but he had an incredible sense of humor. In fact, when I think of his humor, I like to call his type of humor sneak attack humor. Um, because you could be in an ordinary situation, maybe it's even a boring situation, and if you listen to the mumbling of his voice, he'll insert some sarcastic tone with a very sarcastic response. In fact, uh, I was helping him try to figure out how to tie a bow tie once, and if you've ever tried to tie one for someone else, you know you try, you start across from the person trying to do it, but it doesn't really work well, so you actually have to stand behind them and start doing this number. And so I was trying to help Reese tie his bow tie, and he goes, well, I'm a little too close to my preacher. <laughs> but as all of you know, Reese uh, also had an incredible sense of style. And if you look around today, there are a lot of people that are dressed exactly like Reese. And I know for me, if I wanted to know how to dress, I didn't have to go to a magazine. I could just look at what Reese was wearing and know that I was in good shape. And so I was even trying to decide today what it was that I could wear uh, that made me think of Reese. And so I was like, all right, I got two options. I can wear a bow tie or I can wear chubbies. And for the sake of the audience, I decided to go with the bow tie today. But one of the things that I love so much about Reese more than anything is just how much he added to everything. He would take those ho-hum moments of life and insert his wit, his creativity, his smile, and turn it into a celebration. Sharing stories and memories, celebrating life, every single one of those things are great things to do. So today, we're going to celebrate and share about his life. A lot of you are going to hear things about Reese you knew. Some of you are going to hear things that you didn't know. Some of you are going to be moved to tears. Some of you are going to be moved to just a fond laughter. And then some of you are going to be moved to a belly laugh. But whatever it is, I want you to know that both tears and laughter are signs of love. Because it's laughter and tears that come from the heart. 
So it's okay to laugh. And it's okay to cry. So today, we're going to sing some songs together. We're going to pray together. We're going to laugh together. We're going to cry together. We're going to fellowship with one another. And we're going to share some memories of Reese. Because why wouldn't we? When there's so much about him and his life to celebrate about. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much for Reese. Lord, we love him and we thank you for his beautiful life. And we thank you for how he added so much to every moment that he walked or stepped into in our life. Lord, we know that it's your loving embrace that supports us. It's your spirit that watches over us even in death. And Lord, I want to ask a special blessing upon these young people that are here today. Lord, I thank you for them. I thank you for their parents. Give them strength and help them to feel your love. Lord, I thank you for the community and the church that have stepped up in such a major way. And Lord, I ask that you be with us and help us to commit ourselves to you. And to put ourselves in your loving care and your keeping. And Lord, in those moments of confusion, help us to trust you even in those times when we just can't understand. In our aching loneliness, Lord, we pray that we will always remember recent love. And so, yeah, while we gather here today, Lord, to say goodbye one last time, we also are here to celebrate the life that Reese enjoyed on this earth and every single precious moment and memory that we had with him. He touched us all in so many different ways. And so we pray that your peace, your presence will be with every single person in this room during this time. We all ask these things in your son's name. Amen. If you would, let's stand for this first song, please. A wonderful Savior is Jesus, my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hides my soul in the depths of the rock, where rivers of pleasure I see. He hides my soul in the depths of the rock, that shadows the dry thirsty land. Salvation is wonderful love. I'll shout with the millions on high. He hides my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows the dry thirsty land. He hides my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with His hand and covers me there with His hand. Wonderful, merciful Savior. 
precious Redeemer and friend. Who would have thought that a lamb could rescue the souls of men? Oh, rescue the souls of men. Counselor, comforter, keeper, spirit we long to embrace. You would have opened our hearts have hopelessly lost the way. Oh, we've hopelessly lost the way. You are the one that we praise. You are the one we adore. You give the healing and grace. Our hearts always hunger for. Oh, our hearts always hunger for. Almighty, infinite Father, faithfully loving your Also, uh, of course, want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, what a tremendous outpouring for this young man, and of course, support for the family here today. My name is Jonathan Kitchens, and of course, I've known Reese uh, since he and his family moved here many years ago. Um, but I have had personally the pleasure and the honor of being his youth minister since he was in seventh grade. When I was asked to speak here today and to say a few words about his time with the youth group and, and the impact that he made, uh, I felt a very big challenge uh, to be able to, uh, to bring that into just a few stories. There is so much that could be said about him, so many stories to tell, uh, whether it was how he always came up with the best nicknames for everyone in the group, uh, most of which still stick. Uh, his, of course, quick-witted sense, sense of humor, which has been spoken about. And really, uh, for me personally, one thing that I loved was how he was really the only one in the youth group that ever got my 90s pop culture references, <laughs> uh, which generally consisted of just recycled Seinfeld jokes. But he was an extremely impactful young man. But what I thought I would do today is tell you a few things about Reese Johnson that he brought to the Robert Stowe Youth Group things that really and truly, unless you were, were there, you may not know about. Uh, number one, he brought a sense of style and fashion to the youth group. And please understand, I, I realize that's not a secret. Everyone real, knows what a snazzy dresser he was. He had, as has been said already, a style and a swagger all his own. But one thing in, in particular about this was how all the other guys in the youth group followed his lead, just as we all have seen today with everyone here. He would wear his chubby shorts, and uh, he would wear them everywhere we went, everywhere the youth group would go, even if it was uh, outings with other church youth groups in the area when we would get together. And there was one youth minister in particular from another church. Uh, his name was, was Rob, and he didn't really care for them. Uh, he had a problem with those shorts, and so he would always make little comments to him every time we would see him. He would yell out across the room, hey, where's the rest of your pants, or uh, if you'll let me, I'll buy you some new shorts, things like this. And on one occasion, he came up to Reese and told him that the reason he talked about it and the reason he was concerned was because he was afraid it might cause others to lust. To which Reese very calmly looks back at him and replies, Rob, do you have a problem with lust? 
Hence, the youth group hashtag, Stop Lusting Rob, lives on forever. <laughs> Number two, Reese brought his interior decorating skills to the youth group. And I know that may be shocking, and not many of you know about this. I know not a lot do. In fact, I know for certain the elders here at this church don't, and so this may also be my resignation speech as well. <laughs> But here goes. Um, the youth room used to be not in this building. It used to be next door upstairs uh, in the fellowship hall area. And one day before class started, it was just myself and Reese and a few other students that were in there just chit-chatting, making small talk. Uh, when Reese looks over and notices a hammer and a broken pencil. And so he grabs it, and again, we're just continuing to talk, and he's kind of sitting in his chair. He's throwing it up, trying to swing and hit it with the hammer. And time and time again, he kept throwing it up, swing and miss, swing and miss. And so being the responsible, mature youth minister that I am, I said, hey, listen, let me hold the pencil and you can hit it out of my hand. And for whatever reason, we both thought that was a good idea. So I stand there and I hold the pencil like this, arms stretched out, Reese winds up, swings, and the hammer comes out of his hand. <laughs> Flies across the room from us and sticks in the wall. <laughs> I, of course, am freaking out and trying to see who may be downstairs that heard the bang. Reese very calmly walks over to a box that was near the hole, slides it over. <laughs> turns and looks at me and says, what hole? <laughs> Number three, Reese brought new ideas to the youth group. When Reese joined the youth group in seventh grade, I was still actually fairly new in youth ministry. Uh, and so at times, I felt as though I was learning and growing right along with the students, especially when it came to when we would go places, learning new rules to put in place because of something that had happened on the last trip. And so, Reese, thanks to him, we now have implemented one of the longest standing rules in the youth group to this day. The guys are not allowed to bring shaving cream to any overnight function. <laughs> now, we may look at lifting this rule once I have made the final payment to the Embassy Suites in Huntsville. But at this point, that rule remains in place. Another rule that was added because of Reese is that no one is allowed to climb palm trees. Now, you're just going to have to trust me on that one. But please understand, it's not because he fell out of the tree. Actually, it is quite the opposite. Reese was very good at climbing trees and could come down out of one quite quickly. Just ask some of the others in the youth group if you want to know that story. And finally, it didn't matter where we stay or what time of year it is, middle of summer or dead of winter. If there was a body of water around, all the guys late at night are going to run out there and jump in the water. Now, if you didn't know Reese, uh, all of this may sound very mischievous. It may sound like someone who was up to no good. But if you knew Reese, you know exactly what all of this was about. Reese had one of the most beautiful smiles I have ever seen, an infectious laugh, and a heart of gold. Yes, Reese loved to have a good time. But what was so beautiful about all these stories and the many, many more that I could tell you is that he wanted more than anything for others to laugh and smile right along with him. Reese was always always looking out for others. He never wanted anyone to feel excluded in any way. He was welcoming to guests, and he was a friend to those who needed a friend. So to sum it up, the one thing that I will always remember that Reese Johnson brought to the Robert Stowe Youth Group was joy. You are loved, you are missed, Thank you, Reese, and thank you all.
I wasn't expecting to be up here today, but I got the courage to do it after all. I'm going to give you a little different perspective of Reese. First, I want to say I've known the Johnson family for a long time. They are my oldest and dearest friends. And we've been through a lot together. So we lived in Knoxville in the same subdivision together for several years. And we always said if one of us moves, the other's going to have to go too. So we got sent here. And in a year, they came too. Bought a house in the same subdivision. I want to read a Bible scripture. Acts 17, 26. From one man he made every nation of men that they should inha inhabit the whole earth. And he determined the time set for them and the exact places where they should live. Susan and Brian and I have read this scripture before because how amazing is that that we've kind of followed each other along and been together all this time and I want to say that the Johnsons they have a servant's heart they walked the talk I wasn't a very good Christian until I met them. Well, still I'm really not, but um, they showed me what really a good Christian should be like. And Susan was in the water with me when I got baptized. I remember We joined the church that uh, Susan and Brian belong to in Knoxville. And there's a lot of those members here today that I'm so happy to see. They helped me raise my kids. So I had one child when I met them. And Susan was quick to tell me how I could help my child behave better. And I was so <laughs> grateful. It turns out he was an ADD after all. It was just a lack of parenting skills. <laughs> so he, with a little help from Susan and my church family, did a lot better. And then Ryan was born, who's now 21, and sitting here today. Well, Ryan summed it up in his Facebook post. He doesn't have... A childhood memory that doesn't include Reese. Ryan was about two, three when Reese was born. And I'll never forget the day that Susan came rushing over to my house to show me her pregnancy test stick that was positive. I was so happy for her because they had tried for a long time. They did what the Bible said, take care of widows and orphans, and I've seen them take care of many orphans, but Reese was the biggest blessing from God from day one, from the day she showed me that pregnancy test, I watched her go through nine months of pregnancy where she was very moody did things she normally wouldn't do. In fact, she actually gave somebody the finger on the interstate in Knoxville, I'm sure, one day. <laughs> and she was horrified about it, I promise you. She was crying and carrying on about it. And Reese didn't help, or I'm sorry, Brian didn't help matters. I remember her being in the shower, and Brian decided he was going to scare her with wearing a Max Headroom. I don't know, you guys probably young kids don't even know who that is, but he put on a mask and scared her to death, freaked her out really bad. I've never seen anybody put on so much fluid when they were pregnant. 
Susan had to wear house shoes the whole last couple of months because her feet were so swollen she couldn't even wear shoes. But I was there the day that Reese was born. Susan and I both had the same OB doctor and I remember her going into labor and the first thing she did, because he was kind of a good looking guy, and uh, Susan said, I'm gonna call the hospital and see who's on call. And uh, we called and it wasn't him, so she was like, good, I'm not gonna shave my legs. <laughs> well, guess what? Turns out they were shift changing and he ended up being there after all. So she was like, give me a razor. Just silliness. Uh, Reese was over eight pounds, and we didn't think he was coming um, by C-section, but that's the way he came, unexpectedly. But the day she brought Reese home from the hospital, he had pooped in his car seat, <laughs> went all the way up his back, and she cried. She was like, Whoa, what have I done? So emotional. And I just thought it was hilarious. So, because I'd already been through it a couple of times and I loved it. It was almost like sweet revenge because Brian used to tell me, because Susan kept, she kept Houston and Ryan, my oldest two, and, uh, and then she kept my little one, her and her mom, Tony, who Tony loves like her own grandchild, thank God. Um, but Brian used to tell me, and I'm sorry if I'm going on too long, but oh, my kid will never do that. He'd look at my boys, and I remember him telling me, you know, he would have a plate, and, like, he wouldn't even let Susan fix his plate because he didn't want anybody touching his plate. And he would get so grossed out. And I don't know if one of the boys touched his plate or something, but he was like, oh, my kid will never do that. And I just laughed. I said, and this was before, obviously before Reese, and I just said, you just wait, Buster. You just wait. Your day's coming. So you think Reese never touched his plate? I distinctly remember Reese sitting on the table eating a big turkey leg and then throwing it. <laughs> I remember when Reese was two and he got his first haircut because he didn't have hair for the longest time. And then he got big, beautiful curls. And Brian, believe it or not, used to have curly hair just like it. So none of you probably even know that, but he had curls just like Reese. And uh, we got a comb that night before he got his hair cut, and we teased it up really tight and made his hair this big. And we took a picture of him. I'm sure you have that picture somewhere. I was kind of hoping to see it today. But Reese and Ryan, and Houston, and Joey, and Nikki, and Drew. I remember them riding their ripsticks all over the neighborhood, riding their skateboards, having their little Healy shoes with the skates in them, terrorizing the poor residents of Greystone. I know some of you are here so if somebody rang your doorbell and took off, it was probably them. There's a house um, at the end of the cul-de-sac on Heathrow Drive that has a handprint in it. That's one of my kids. But I remember having somebody was having an open house in the neighborhood and there were balloons and somebody brought a helium tank. They thought it was funny to go over and suck the helium out of it and talk funny. So we got a talking to by some of the neighbors at different times for the terrorization that our kids were causing the neighborhood. So I'm sorry for that. But of all the things they could get into, I guess that wasn't that bad after all. So most of you know Reese after he was a little bit older. But I knew him when he was just a thought. And then from the day he was born. And he had the beautiful most beautiful smile. He was such a little booger, but we loved him so much. He was God's gift to Susan and Brian. He was my boy's brother. 
and he's in heaven now, watching over all of us. And we don't understand what God's plan is or why, but I know um, our oldest son passed away a year ago in a car accident, and Susan and Brian were there for us. In fact, Brian's going to be here, standing here, the same spot that my husband was standing in the same situation, having to give the same speech a year ago. So we've been there, and we know. And I'm sorry, it's going to be a hard road for you. We're still there. It's not going to go away, but it's going to get better. Back to the scripture that I read, how God determines the times and places that we should live. God doesn't make mistakes. Susan and Brian were put in my life for a reason. Reese was put in their life for a reason. God knew before Reese was born who his parents were going to be. God chose them. Reese made his impact on this world according to God's plan. And that's not for us to question. But I have faith in Susan and Brian's deep-rooted faith in God that they're going to be okay. And they're going to be reunited with their beloved Reese in heaven one day. And I kind of have a feeling that Reese and Drew are up there playing video games right now and riding their ripsticks. Anyway, God bless you, and it was my pleasure and honor to speak on behalf of the Johnsons today. Hello, everybody. My name is Tanner Deeds, and I still remember the day I first met Reese Johnson. Walking in school, uh, ninth grade, first day of school, um, I remember walking in my classroom, seeing this mountain of brown curly hair and this big goofy smile, just like, who is this guy? You know, summer just ended, like, how can you be happy, you know? And, and uh, you know, but, uh, you know, I quickly learned that, that that's the type of friend I want to have. And um, we had a few classes that year, and I remember we'd be sitting in class, and we always sat next to each other, and he would lean over and whisper something in my ear, I'd start busting out laughing, and you know, all the teachers would just get mad at me and get me in trouble, and, you, know, was, you know, he's just a great guy, always funny, and I always remember that about him. Uh, tenth grade, every class together in the IB program, um, and, you know, during that, that year, that's when we both turned 16, and for better or for worse, you know, we became mobile, you know, so, you know, the, the floodgates opened, and, you know, anything was possible. Um, we, also, we used to always go to uh, Sibley Street or Secret Beach behind Coffee Loft and, you know, hang up Enos and play music, laugh, and, um, or you know, we'd go to Coffee Loft after school to do homework when in reality we would never do homework. That, <laughs> trying to do homework with Reese is absolutely impossible. <laughs> it's, it's not going to happen. Um, but I'd say 11th grade junior year is when he, he became one of my best friends. Um, we, we would hang out every, every day at the school, six classes a day, Saturday, Sunday. We'd always just be doing anything. Um, I, I still remember we, over the summer we went to Fort Morgan, you know, almost about you know once or twice a week, and we took the big yellow jeep down there, and um, it broke down. And we were trying to we were we were trying to fi we were trying to fix it. And he, dro he dropped his keys in the engine and we couldn't find them. <laughs> so uh, this is about this is about ten o'clock at night. We're no way we're getting home in time. We had to call AAA to give us a tow. It took two hours from to get there, and. Um, or we, just, we were just sitting there just laughing at, at ourselves um, and, you know, going to Seaside with um, the Heron family. Uh, I remember he climbed the Seaside Tower, which is about 60 feet tall. It, uh, it had planks of wood about this wide going all the way up. You can put your hands and feet. And you, you saw pictures of that. I just remember how legendary that was for him. And it was absolutely insane. Um, but everything he's contributed to my life, um, you, know, we used to, you know, he introduced me to Little Caesars. Which is my favorite pizza. We would, we would always go to Little Caesars uh, after school just about every single day, and we'd go five dollar pizza, and then we'd go to the Deli Depot next door, get the one ninety nine buy one get one free large Slurpees. Caesar, <laughs> call it Caesars and Slurpees, and it was, it, it was uh, 
So, you know, his love for Little Caesars passed on to me. His short shorts, he, you know, perfected the art of the short shorts, and I'm still trying to learn, you know, how he could pull it off so well. Um, about a quarter of the music, my playlist is, you know, from him, just everything he showed me, all the different types of music. Um, the Birkenstocks, he introduced me to Birkenstocks. He actually helped me get them. Um, and also, he passed on to me the love for Walmart rotisserie chicken. She can, I've never... <laughs> I've, I've never seen anyone eat a rotisserie chicken <laughs> as fast as him and in so few bites, but it was an art form at that point. Um, but he contributed so much more to us than just you know, the things you can touch, hear, or see. Um, his joy and charisma has become a part of everyone who knew him. Um, he loved others like no one else and was accepting of everybody. Um, all you know, the amazing friends I have today, um, I met through him. And, you know, we're just the absolute best group of guys. And the support system they've set up for me and everyone else is indescribable. And, you know, I'm forever thankful for them and what he has done to introduce me to this group of guys. Um, but most importantly, he has taught me how to see the light in even the darkest of situations. Um, you know, he's, his in, you know, unending infinite happiness, um, you know, is just, through the situation has helped me so much. And... Um, even though he isn't here with us today, um, everything that he's given us will live on forever. Thank you. It's, uh, it's definitely what Reese would have wanted me to wear. I met Reese my junior year in high school, and as well as Tanner, we had every single class together in IB. And uh, by the end of junior year summer, I called him my best friend. Um, Reese, Tanner, Eric, and I called ourselves the Four Horsemen of IB. <laughs> um, and uh, you could walk in any single IB classroom, and we'd be separated in each corner of the class. <laughs> Um, we'd get kicked out of Miss Hartley's class frequently. Um, one time, we uh, didn't bring a form to watch a movie, and um, she wasn't going to let us watch it, so she kicked us out. And Reese did not agree with that. <laughs> and um, she brought us to this innocent teacher's class, and um, Miss Hartley and Reese were getting into it on the way there. And we walked into this silent classroom, and Reese and um, Miss Hartley were screaming at each other at that point, and um, just uh, on the last day of um, summer, he busted a uh, firecracker in my ear, and uh, I was deaf for about a week, and every single day he he felt so bad i don't think he knew what he was what he was doing when he did it and um he would send me articles of how my hearing was supposed to come back with my <laughs> <laughs> um and then uh this senior year we um we all got the boot out of ib and um <laughs> We were devastated on the first day because we didn't have every single class together. We only had um, English and career prep and lunch together. And uh, him and I would sit together at lunch every day, um, talk about random things. And um, that pretty much brings us to now. And um, I find myself wanting to talk to Reese um, a lot. And I'll text him sometimes, which maybe sounds a little bit weird, but. Uh, I wrote him a letter um, this morning, sitting in my room. So I'll read that now. Dear anxious and shaky Reese, <laughs> I wish things turned out differently. I can't express to these people how much I loved you. I hope you knew how much I did. Some of the best memories that I've had with you came from this past summer. I was always so jealous that you could go anywhere barefoot and pull it off as if that's how it was supposed to be. 
I need to personally thank you for doing my college application for me as I watch from behind and answer all the questions for you. <laughs> I wish we could have gone to college together even though that plan was already fading. Anyways, I have one thing I wanna share with you today. I know you lost hope in your project for the UNCSA titled Where True Happiness Lies, but to this day, I think that it was one of the most creative and Reese ways to pass along happiness, which was what you always did. I will try my hardest to live my life through your legacy, and I promise that this is what I think of you. You were not selfish. You always considered others in your decision making, never putting yourself in the clear above anyone else. And lastly, you were not scared of anything. You were one of the bravest boys that I ever came in contact with. I'm sorry, Reese. I and everyone else will always love you. Sage. Uh, Reese Johnson was more than my best friend. He was like my brother. Like my really dark, complected, goofy, curly-haired brother. <laughs> <laughs> I met Reese through uh, Sage and Tanner Deeds, and I'll never be able to thank them enough for showing me what I really needed in a true friend. When I first met Reese, uh, the, the very first day, I, I didn't even know him, and uh, he asked me if I wanted to go mudding <laughs> in his yellow Jeep. And I was like, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, now I remember we all got covered in mud, and I was mad at him because <laughs> I was, and, uh, and ever since that day, uh, I don't think a day's gone by where I haven't seen him, or at least thought about him. Right when I met Reese, and I saw his bright clothes and his goofy smile, I knew that that was something I needed to be a part of. When I first met Reese, uh, I was in a dark place in my life. And he was the only one that got me out of it. He showed overwhelming support every day. And I remember one specific day I was home by myself and he was checking on me and I wasn't answering his text. So he busted my back door and <laughs> he was screaming, cheer up, cheer up. You know, it's time to you have to go do something today. You can't waste it. He made me laugh like no other person ever has. It was like a laugh that I felt in my soul that hurt your stomach, like in my. Reese Johnson has influenced me more than any other human being I've ever met, with his constant happiness and his constant smile. I've never seen Reese boast or brag about anything in his life. He always showed love to others, no matter the situation. He accepted everyone to his heart. And I'm forever grateful that he accepted me because I don't know where I would be today without him. I will love him for the rest of my life. And I'm so grateful for him and the Johnson family. And I will be here for you every step of the way. Thank you.
Um, uh, Reese is the closest that I've ever been to a human being in my entire life, and started off from the first time that I met him. I, I vastly appreciated his uh, disregard for others' emotions and the fact that uh, he refused to wear shoes any place that he went and had no problem getting into boxers at a hot tub in a country club. <laughs> um, one of the more evil things uh, Reese had about him is uh, one problem with knowing him and getting really close to him in a, uh, in a humorous way is he knows exactly what makes you twist and he has caused me very, very severe pains multiple times in my life from <laughs> forcing me to laugh more than I ever have with anybody else. And it was moments like that when I was laughing with him and, uh, and sharing my time with him that it seemed like time stopped existing in the way that it normally did because of how at home I felt with him. And I think the, uh, the one way I would describe Reese more than anything else is he gave me hope in every single walk of my life. Um, the first night I actually uh, got to know him, uh, it, uh, it felt like there was, a, um, there was a large amount of thoughts and feelings that I had had about the world and about people that had been building up and this was finally my chance to have a human being that I could really um, discuss these with in a, in a, in a really helpful way. Um, he introduced me to many of my closest friends, which I could never thank him enough for. And I think one thing that I take away from him the most is his amazing way of seeing the best in personalities and seeing what could be derived from any human being. Reese allowed me in the darkest times of my life to absolutely forget anything that I could have been mad about. He was a human being that I met that was the best at giving me hope for being alive. Um, together, he and I would, we were very, um, we were very transparent in what we both had pain about. And the way that we would talk to each other and spend time with each other, um, which I'm eternally grateful for, created an energy that I will never forget. And In many ways, Reese lives on in my life in the way that I saw him give comfort to people as much as possible. Sometimes it wouldn't work that well. Sometimes he would ask if people like pogs. Um, but at Reese's core, I think he understood other people's pains a lot and his I think his biggest passion in life was making other human beings feel at home. And he did this extremely well. In many ways, I saw my life as being, being with him and being without him. Even when he was here, um, the times that I would spend without him and experiences that I would have without him, I always interpreted through his eyes as well. And Reese has allowed me Reese has given me more than ever I could ever replicate to any human being. And every single day he allows me to see the best in human beings. And he lives on in my heart, and, uh, 
and I have made a, uh, a conscious decision to, um, to really contrast uh, things that he gave to me that I can give to other people. And that's the way in which I honor Reese. Hey guys, I used to come to church with Reese all the time. I've never been in this building before. It's pretty nice. Good on you guys for building this. The old one smelled a little funny. This one's a bit better. The other one probably still smells funny. But So when I was in elementary school and during the earlier years of my life, I just went where, to school wherever my mom was teaching. She's a teacher in case you didn't know. And um, so I moved to elementary schools all the time. I was at one for like a few years, another one for a few years. So. When I got to middle school, the longest place I'd ever been was Rosington, and it was a class of 28 or 38 kids, and wasn't a big fan of many of them. They were all kind of weird. Um, so when I got to middle school, I really didn't know anyone. Um, I had lost a lot of my friends from elementary school, and a lot of them have returned to my life. Landon, my best friend from elementary school, starts hanging out with us now. It's pretty fun. But so. In middle school is when I met Reese. We were in Miss Mott's class together, and we made that woman's life miserable. She <laughs> hated us. Reese and I's friendship started um, at the, if you've been to CVMS, you know, where the break area is. There's all these benches off to the side and fences, and we were always specifically told, do not sit on the fences. No one listened. So one day, I just knew him because our Miss Mott's class was right before break. And we were out there eating probably grips. That's, that was our main f fuel back in the day. And I was sta he was sitting on the bench, and I was standing in front of him. And we had spoken a few times. And he said, Eric, you look gay. <laughs> I punched him in the balls as hard as I could. <laughs> We've been best friends ever since. <laughs> so seventh grade, we were, we, were we were pretty good friends. We never really hung outside of school because I'm an only child, and my parents are overly protective. And, if I wanted to hang out with someone, they needed clearance from the CIA for me to leave the house. <laughs> so, so over that summer between seventh and eighth grade, it was when Reese and I really truly became best friends. All we did was play Minecraft on the Xbox 24 seven, basically that or Black Ops one. And that's really all we did um, because I was not allowed to leave the house. <laughs> So we, we would play Minecraft with our friend Wesley and Cody, but Cody's parents are also super strict and he wasn't allowed to have a microphone to talk to internet strangers. <laughs> he could have gotten digitally abducted, I'm sure. He's a cute little blonde boy. So we would play Minecraft and then he and his family would always go on these like, how long, two week long trips to Maine. And that was the worst because I didn't have anyone to play Minecraft with because Cody couldn't have a mic to talk to me. <laughs> So I just played Minecraft by myself for two weeks, and it, it was awful. Parents didn't let me leave the house. So school year starts, he gets back from Maine, and back to that teacher, Miss Mott. For every book we read, we had to do a project, and she was, she was pretty relaxed on like format, like you could do PowerPoints, you could do a speech or anything. Reese and I decided to make videos, and man, those did not go over well. Rewatching them these past few days, I'm very happy we hit puberty. We both sounded like little girls. <laughs> Some say I still do. I disagree. But so finally, my parents got permission from the director of the FBI to let me leave the house to go to Reese's house. And we would film these videos, and we discovered our mutual love of fireworks and small explosives. <laughs> so between tormenting Nikki and blowing things up, which I tru we truly gave Nikki the worst time of her life. She used to like me. You used to be a pretty big fan of me. You liked me better than Wesley, because I hadn't made fun of you yet. And then one day, I, I, my parents dropped me off, because you know who can drive in middle school? Um, and she was wearing the ugliest pants I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> she called them boyfriend jeans, and I said no respecting boyfriend would ever wear those pants. <laughs> they were what a mom in the 80s wore. And this was before mom jeans were a true fad. You were an early adopter, I'll give you that. But I Googled mom jeans on my sick iPhone 3GS, and sure enough, Nikki's pants were the third result. And she hated me ever since. 
understandable. I still don't like you either, Nikki. So we would torment Nikki, go swimming, make those truly awful videos. We'd get Wesley to come over and we'd just film, film these stupid videos and edit them on iMovie because the Baldwin County public school system thought it'd be a great idea to give children MacBooks. <laughs> I disagree to this day. But I'll never forget the, f whoops. The first time I ever went to Reese's house it was like, they were peak organic. And my family was not organic at the time. And he said, Eric, I'm gonna make you something to drink and it'll be the best thing you'll ever taste. It was not. <laughs> he took a lime LaCroix way before every basic white girl in the entire country adopted LaCroix. Yeah, I'm talking about you, Worth. Yeah. <laughs> Don't even. They're still gross. So we got a lime LaCroix, and I'd never seen them before, and he put vanilla stevia in it, and it was just this dark brown liquid. He told me it tasted exactly like a Sprite. I would have rather sucked on a battery than <laughs> got the acid. It was disgusting. And then he started coming over to my house and our neighborhood's relatively new. So they built this, when they were backfilling all the homes, there was this huge 15 foot pile of dirt, a football field long. We would tell my mom, we're gonna go back out, out behind it and just shoot fireworks in the air. We were shooting them at each other. <laughs> you all think you know fear until you have Reese Johnson running at you with two, a Roman candle in each hand and one between his teeth for when those two run out. <laughs> and you're trying to run away, but he had been doing cross country a lot longer than you had. And he was a lot faster and you get pelted. Our shirts were smoldering. I still have the shorts and shirts we wore because we have hardly grown. I had this pair of orange shorts that are just pocketed with burn holes. It was terrifying. So eighth grade comes along. Um, we're still in Miss Mott's class and she didn't trust us. If she left the room, she would make both of us walk with her to wherever she was going. <laughs> And I was in band at the time, and I, I was in percussion for whatever reason. I was never good at it. So I always had a stick bag with me, and she would not let me keep the stick bag with me because she did not want to know what I could do with drumsticks. <laughs> the windows would have been broken. So one day, she leaves the classroom, and we're, we're sitting in there, and she had this very specific rule, you're not allowed to look at games. And I still, to this day, think it was a ploy to get us in trouble. She walked straight to Mr. Stanton's room, which was the guy in charge of MacBooks. Remember the binoculars on the top of the screen? Those popped up. She emailed us immediately. We were written up. <laughs> so after numerous parent-teacher conferences with both of our parents, meeting with the principal, meeting with other teachers, they all hated us. We deserved it. In retrospect, we were the worst. So finally, we realized we need to get the heck out of here. So he had told me about this thing called IB. He's like, Eric, you're kind of smart. Let's do it. So. We applied, and on my application I, for hobbies, I think I put yo-yo tricks, because we were in yo -yo, into yo-yoing at the time. I couldn't even walk the dog on the floor, much less do a swing. He was so much better at it than I was. So we moved to IB, two fresh-faced 15-year-olds that really knew nothing, especially at this new school where we knew absolutely no one. And we quickly fell in with like all the IB kids and all the um, other freshmen, and we kept getting added to these group texts. And naturally, we didn't have anyone's phone numbers on our iPhone 4S's, but um, there was this one girl in the um, group text and we had asked who her name was and they said Worth and I was like, you know that's not a real name. <laughs> Worthington is the fakest name I've ever heard. <laughs> I refuse. So one day Reese asked me like, what's Worth's last name? And I said Wampus. Because <laughs> Worth Wampus is a stellar name. He believed me for three years until, <laughs> until he slid in this Canadian girl's DMs and they were best friends and we all became friends with them and Wampus stuck. I'll never forget the day that he saw her and as a greeting he bit her forehead. Because that's how he said hello sometimes. We didn't question it. So IB, we hated it. It was a lot of work, a lot of arbitrary work that never really made any sense. We just kind of wanted to shoot fireworks at each other and get into trouble, which we did. Oh. I forgot a point. One time, it was the summer between eighth and ninth grade, he invited me over and he told me about this orange tree that one of the local properties had. He did not own that property. We did not own that property. So me, Reese, and a few other kids sneak onto this property to go snack some oranges and we ended up getting chased by a farmer on a Polaris 4x4 and we outran him and escaped. We climbed over a barbed wire fence, relatively unscathed, had a few cuts and bruises, but we survived. And then one time he took me to Atlanta to um, 
visit his Aunt Toots and Uncle Charlie, who are sitting right there, first time ever meeting him. I didn't think Aunt Toots was a real name either. <laughs> I have a hard time with believing people's names. But, and really, it was during the time of the Tour de France, and we were both really into cycling at the time, so really all we did was sit around and watch that. And I had do, been doing cross country for about a year at the time, and they live right next to these really nice trails. And Reese and his dad were really into running, so I went with them, and they went to the hard trail. Eric was not ready for the hard trail. <laughs> Eric made about two miles in and then walked back, and he kept running back and forth trying to get me to go, and I was like, no. I just told him no every time. I was not going to do that. So even in IB, we still tormented teachers. I think we've been the most hated students at Central Baldwin Middle School and Fairhope High School. We have made many of our teachers' lives absolutely miserable. In retrospect, they all love us now. But, and then for whatever reason, I think it was soft, I don't think it was last year, it was sophomore year, a bunch of our teachers decided to take us to Birmingham for an overnight field trip. Because that's, yeah, yeah. Because what's better than taking a bunch of teenagers overnight? So, bus ride there. We really liked this game called What Are the Odds? I ended up, I think I've had to lick Sage's foot, take his sock off with my mouth. I ate four Tic Tacs we found on the ground that were from a previous Greyhound bus ride trip. <laughs> Reese ate a rock once at cross country. Not like a pebble, it was a stone. He looked for it. He looked for its exit for weeks. He never found it. I like to think he still has it. I think it helped with digestion, like the ancient dinosaur vegetarians. So, so on this Beeham trip, Birmingham, I wrote Beeham because it's an abbreviation. But <laughs> so this Beeham trip, we toured BSC the first day, and we did nothing but goof around the entire day. And then we get back to the hotel. The hotel had a pool. We were not allowed in the pool. We did not listen. All the boys go down there, and we have some truly great pictures of every single boy in IB crammed into this hot tub mitt for four at most. We tried to get one of our friends to be our meatball, but he refused in this pot of boys. <laughs> so, so we're all swimming in the pool, acting a fool, horse playing, screaming. So our gracious English teacher, Karen Myrick, sent the only male chaperone we had, Jeff Gabarino, local Olympian, to come down there to get onto us and tell us to get out of the pool. He went down there and said, quite frankly, I don't care you're down here. Stop being so loud. We stayed for two more hours. We went back upstairs, and I forget who brought their Xbox to this overnight field trip, and we played Call of Duty Zombies for hours, and then they all started playing Risk. They pulled an all-nighter. I did not. I wanted to sleep and actually tour the next school. They were all falling asleep in the seminar at um, UAB. They were falling asleep, and I'll never forget the um, guy that was administering the, the, um, the seminar ended up calling them out, telling them they needed to wake up. They didn't. They didn't. So eventually junior year came along, and that's when the IB kids, all the IB kids, had, the class had become small enough to where we were all together for every single class. And our first period junior year was our lovely English teacher, Ms. Coleman. She remains the only teacher that does not put us in four separate corners. We all sat together. I don't know how she tolerated it. So we just sat there, and we never did our work. We mostly just goofed around on our laptops and then our Chromebooks because the school decided those were better than MacBooks. They are paperweights that have a screen. <laughs> so all of our other teachers ended up putting us in four separate corners. Our history teacher, Miss Roberts, didn't know us at the time, and obviously she hadn't been warned because it was me, Sage, and Reese, and then Tanner was two spaces behind us. And I'll never forget Tanner coming up to us after class one day saying how much he hated his seat because he was close enough to hear the shenanigans, but not close enough to take part in the shenanigans. <laughs> Eventually, we were all moved to four separate corners of the room. Even this year, Sage and I had the class together, and conveniently, we were on opposite sides of the room. I remained. It was intentional. What else have I written? Oh, yeah. So you've obviously heard about Reese's love of chicken. It's kind of disgusting. I don't like meat that's connected to a bone. I don't eat ribs. And on that Atlanta trip, our first one, that, when he came with my family, um, I rode up with his family because he and his dad were doing a duathlon in um, Birmingham, I believe. We had stopped at Ruby Tuesday on the way up there, and I hate Ruby Tuesday with a passion. He ordered a whole rack of ribs and a salad bar. You know, salad bar, you get a salad, not Reese. 
Reese got shredded carrots and croutons on a plate, and that's what he ate. And then he ate that whole rack of ribs in the fastest amount of time. Didn't really clean his hands. I think he wiped them on me. <laughs> I was his napkin. So, and then on the drive up there to Oak Mountain, you know, we were in the back of the Jeep because it had the bike rack on it. And, um, you know, you know, when two people are in a back seat, you sit on opposite sides of the seat, and it was at night, so we were trying to sleep. Not Reese. Reese sat in the middle and just laid on me as support, even though there were backrests. It was obnoxious, and I couldn't sleep at all. So, back to his love of chicken. We, in Miss Russell's class, he and I would always shout across the um, classroom at each other because she ensured we were on different sides of the classroom. She claims it was alphabetical. I know it wasn't. <laughs> So we would always shout about who could eat more chicken nuggets, and I swore it was me. I was wrong. So we finally get this competition going. It's, it was Reese, me, Reese, and our friend Ethan, and Ethan's girlfriend, who was our administrator, to ensure we actually ate the chicken nuggets. So we all, it was like $8 for 40 chicken nuggets. Each of us had 40. We're all sitting there, and we hadn't eaten for two days in preparation. And we were prepared. We were ready. I thought I could win. Ethan thought he could win. Reese knew he would win. <laughs> so we start going, the first 10 go down super easy, and then once you hit 15, it's a wall. It's a terrible wall. Reese ate all 40 in 17 minutes. <laughs> 38 minutes rolls around, and Ethan and I have about six left apiece, and Reese is getting impatient at this point and asking if we were gonna finish them, because he wanted them. <laughs> I don't even think he choked it down with any sauce or drink, because he, he didn't want to buy a drink, because he said, that's extra money. <laughs> He needed to save that money for more chicken. <laughs> so we've just truly been best friends, more of a brother. I'm an only child, thankfully. I would never want to have siblings, but he was always he was always my brother. And we truly ruined some teachers' lives. They love us, though. I love them, even though they didn't like us sitting near each other. And then... Reese is in heaven, I'm sure, but I like to think of Reese as a current ghost trying to make our lives as happy as possible. Like two days ago, Worth was shopping at, working at her local boutique that we despise because downtown boutiques are disgusting. <laughs> and this, this old man in his brand new Volvo SUV had parked in front, and I assume he thought he was just gonna run into a store really quick and come back and leave. So he left it running, and I assume he left it, in, he thought he left it in park. He left it in neutral. And this car is big enough that it rolled into the building. And I like to think that man did put it in park and ghostry slipped it into neutral. Because <laughs> we can never stop messing with Wampus. We never will. And my, my new excuse for when I inevitably don't do my homework, because who wants to work at home, is Ghost Reese ate my homework. <laughs> he would. That boy has eaten at least two reams of copy paper in the past year. In Miss Hartley's class, we, Miss Hartley didn't ass assign us seats at first, which was unwise of her. So we all sat in the very back corner in the darkness so we could cause as much problems as possible. And then eventually she grew sick and tired of it, and she moved me thinking I was the problem. <laughs> I was not the problem. The problem persisted. I was just too far away to partake in the problem. She never moved them. I still don't forgive her for that. I should have been. I don't, she's in here right now, I don't know where, but you should have let me sit back there. Oh good, I see you now. <laughs> Thanks, Nolan. So, I hope Ghost Reese continues to make all of our lives a little bit better. Just kind of messing us up from time to time, letting cars bump into downtown boutiques just to inconvenience worth a little bit more, eating my homework. I loved him. I'll miss him a lot. Who else is going to eat 40 chicken nuggets with me? Ethan's sure not going to do it again. We threw up for a few days afterwards. He, Reese was fine. He was eating 20 minutes after we finished. <laughs> he wanted to redo the competition a few days later with 60 nuggets apiece, and we said no. But I wouldn't want to get written up by teachers with anyone else. I wouldn't want to play Minecraft with anyone else. I'll miss him. I love him. He was my best friend. He was my brother. Yep. 
For just about as long as I can remember, I've known Reese. As kids, me, him, and Wesley Adams would go on all kinds of adventures together. My favorite memories are when we'd go find some forest to climb trees and watch him wonder as Reese would jump from tree to tree like a monkey. Or when we'd run through the uh, neighborhood storm drains like explorers discovering a new land. He always had a burning desire for adventure and thrilling experiences, which is one of the reasons why I loved him so much. There was never a dull moment. Skipping forward to the summer before my freshman year of high school, we were in Panama City, and he had already convinced me to join IB and run cross country with him. One of my biggest fears uh, for going to Fairhope was leaving all my friends that I had grown up with all my life. But then he told me something that has stuck with me to this day. He said, Cody, you're a cool guy. Just be who you are and people will love you. But Panama City wasn't just a place where we shared the pains of running and life advice. No, it was where me, Reese, and Eric all found a bag of ruffles in the middle of the canal while kayaking. It was also where we were able to show off our glorious American-themed one-inch inseam running shorts that we called Liberties. <laughs> a large part of who I am today is because of Reese and the influence he has had in my life. He was always encouraging me to be myself and to have no shame in that. And those liberties were one of his main tools in making me a shameless and self-confident person, uh, which is one of the biggest lessons that I have taken from him, along with many others, such as how to rock a bow tie, the correct length of shorts, right here, uh, and the groovy lingo he used, and to stop being such a wimp when it comes to talking to girls. <laughs> As I was sitting in Ms. Coleman's class the other day, I looked over at a poster that he had made with one of his favorite quotes on it. The quote said, so it goes. And so now I say to you, so it goes. So life goes on with all the beautiful memories and lessons Reese has left with us to reflect on. And it's because of this thought that I am forever grateful to have known him and his lively spirit. God is good. God is good. He loves all of his children through his son and now his church. And I can't begin to tell everyone how grateful we are for this church's love and support. Not just now when things are the worst, but uh, ever since we walked through the doors years ago, I also want to thank all of our friends and neighbors. Um, and everything that they have done for us these past few days. Um, we are uh, undeserving of, of all of your friendship. I, uh, I especially want to thank all of Reese's friends, um, especially uh, not only those that, uh, that had the fortitude to stand up here and speak on his behalf, but, uh, but every one of you that touched his life, that uh, were a part of his life. I, uh, I can't, I won't stand here and apologize for the choice that he made that brought us so much pain and sadness. All I can say is I don't understand it. And there were so many things about him that I really didn't understand. Um, some of him was just like looking in a mirror. Uh, other parts of him were just like looking at my wife. <laughs> he was uh, he was never afraid. He's a lot stronger than me and her. He was never afraid to be who and what he was all the time. Uh, he uh, he was truly uh, courageous in everything that he did. I remember uh, one of my friends back in Knoxville, I don't know how many years ago, said, uh, I don't know, probably Reese was probably three or four, and he said, I can see him standing on the back of a truck one day saying, watch this. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I, uh, I failed um, 
to teach him many things. But uh, his mother taught him how to love people. And uh, he loved them unconditionally. And uh, that's the way Jesus loved people. He loved people where they were at. He didn't care if you were rich or poor, if you were a prostitute or a thief. Um, Jesus spoke about denying ourselves, and I think what he was talking about was the conditions that we put on our love. Uh, we're here to celebrate Reese's life, and I thank all of you so much for everything that you've done. Um, regardless of how things ended, I just wanted to thank everyone. And, uh, uh, we live in a, a crazy world, and we are surrounded by mental illness and depression and substance abuse. And uh, I just want to ask all of you to please be alert and uh, and love people where they're at. Again, thank you all very much for being here. God loves us, and God's love can unite us, and God's Spirit can comfort each and every one of us. And we are here um, today in the protective arms and healing of our God, and His Spirit is there and available to each one that will to receive His comfort. Today uh, has been a safe place. It's a safe place to pour out grief. It's been a safe place to share your loneliness. It's just been a safe place to even talk about our hope. And so we've been here today to comfort and support each other in a common loss and remember Reese. But what I want us to also do is to look at God's word and understand that there can be hope even in the midst and the times of despair. 
You know, the death of anyone that we love is hard, but especially when it's someone so young, full of life, and full of talent, like Reese. And sometimes those feelings of loss and grief can no doubt feel, in many moments, overwhelming. And because it's so overwhelming, one thing is abundantly clear. We need each other. We need community. And how, how desperately we need Jesus. And a lot of you may um, know this and you may not. But one thing about Brian and Susan that is probably one of their most underrated qualities is how much they love community. In fact, I know at Robert still here, so much of what we've done and actually now we're starting is because of them too. Because they don't want our relationships to be those where we walk past each other, hey, how are you doing? Fine, good, all right, have a nice day, bye. They understand we all have hurt. We all have joy. We all have a wide range of emotions that we deal with, and we need each other. They have poured so much into community, and thank you for providing that. And I think your sense of community is why there are so many people here today. But we want you to know that today we bring you guys the community. And we want to assure you that beyond a shadow of a doubt, that we will be there for you. And you guys are going to never be alone. But more importantly, we want you to know that someone so much even greater than us watches over each and every one of you. You know, today is a celebration of a life well lived. But it still doesn't take away the fact that death is an inevitable part of life. And it doesn't take away the fact that when someone as full of life as Reese was, leaves a hole in every single one of our hearts. And of course, it's going to raise questions. But one question we'll find ourselves asking so much is this, where in the world is the hope? Psalm 121 says this, I lift up my eyes to the hills and where in the world, where will my help come from? Every time I read that passage, I picture a man standing at the bottom of a mountain looking at something that is so much bigger than he. And when you think about yourself in regards to a mountain, it does at times see something like you could not overcome or you could never even come close to conquering. So you climb up that mountain and it's not easy. You spend moments of doubt, you spill moments of grief. But then as you climb that mountain, you begin to understand and to know that it's not really about the mountain, but it's the one that created that mountain. It's because the psalm goes on to say, see, when I look up to the hills and I wonder where my help comes from, my help comes from the Lord. He made the heavens and the earth. He's your keeper. And he's your shade and he's your right hand. We don't look at the mountain. We won't look at the one that created that mountain. The words of the third lamentation, I think, do really well for a day like this. The writer says, I have been deprived of peace. I've forgotten what even prosperity is. My splendor's gone. All that I had hoped for from the Lord. I remember my affliction. I remember my wondering. The bitterness, the gall, I remember them all. My soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. We are um, experiencing compassions that never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to those who hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It's good for a man to bear the yoke while he's young. Let him sit alone in silence, for the Lord has laid it on him. Let him bury his face in the dust. There may yet still be hope. Let him offer his cheek to one who would strike him, and let him be filled with disgrace, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. Though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. 
for he does not willingly bring affliction or grief to any person. The writer of this lamentation um, knew grief. We don't know what it was um, that he was experiencing or what event caused him to write this. But we do know that he was in pain. And you know, the, the Bible gets credit for a lot of things that it should. It's a book of truth. It's a book of love. It's a book about faith. It's a book about salvation. And it's a book about Jesus. But one of the things that we sometimes fail to mention about the Bible is that it's a book that perfectly speaks to our human emotions. And as I read this lamentation, I can't help but thank God for the fact that not only within this uh, lament, but in other psalms and other places, that He allows His people to express their grief, to express their sorrow, and to express their joy, and to feel comfortable in doing that. Because it's as we express our sorrow, grief, and joy together, what we eventually find as we walk through that together is that God's love is steadfast, and His promises, they're sure. In a psalm that every single one of you probably know, and uh, maybe even as a, a child you used to say this psalm before a sporting event, that is, of course, about the Lord being your shepherd. And that passage, of course, says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. Your rod and your staff would comfort me. And at times, of course, we would definitely uh, want at many, many moments to not to have to go through pain or grief and you know, you even think about this psalm, it doesn't say that we aren't going to experience pain. In fact, in John chapter 16, verse 33, it says that in this world you will have trouble. So it's never promised to us that we won't have pain and we won't have difficulties. But what I do love about this psalm is that it promises us that God will walk through us, with us through those times, and that He will be with us to comfort us and sustain us. And I love the fact that this psalm is such a beautiful picture of the realistic nature of how God is beside us. He gives a picture of a staff. And that staff serves two purposes. To protect and to provide and remind of presence. A lot of times a lion, a bear would come to attack one of the sheep, but the shepherd would use that staff to warn off any evil. But it's also given a picture of the crook of that staff where he would, underneath the belly, calm that sheep and to let him know that he was there. And then the end of that staff would also reach out to that lamb and lift the head of that lamb when it was going through a weary journey. And I'm so glad that I see my God and know my God as that. He's not a God that just gives us some cherry promise that he's going to meet us on the other side of the river. He's way better than that. He is a God that promises to be with us every single step of the way. And so as we walk with Him and you make the choice to walk with Him, it goes on to say that you can experience His new mercies every single day. I'm not naive. I understand that there are a lot of you in this room that have a relationship with the Jesus Christ and those of you that don't. And I understand that there's some of you in this room that know this psalm. But my plea and my encouragement to you is this. Don't just know the psalm. See, because the power is not in the psalm. Don't know the psalm. Know the shepherd. Because it's the shepherd that will sustain you. Because it will shepherd that will be your rock. See, if you let the Lord be your shepherd, he will be your rock. He will be your strength. He is the one that can, when you don't feel like you can, help you keep going. He's the one that will help you deal with life and all of its randomness and even unfairness. He gives you an arm that you can lean on, a shoulder to cry on, and he picks you up when you don't think you can carry on. I know right now life seems very dark, but God's hope is that we will all make it through that darkness and once again walk in the light of hope and faith. Every single one of us have walked in here today with a basket full of memories and a heart full of different kinds of emotions and feelings, and we have those because our lives have been intersected in one way or another with the life of Reese Johnson. Maybe it's because you're an immediate family, or you're just in his circle of friends. 
What a wealth of memories and experiences that we've been shared today. Some of which have been delightful, some sad, some humorous. But they're memories of him. And those memories are to be cherished and to be intentionally explored. See, because working with our memories is one of the most important aspects of grieving, and it may take a long time, but you'll find yourself over the next few days, weeks, months, years, saying things like this. Do you remember when Reese, or I always loved how Reese, don't stop that talking. Share with each other the times of joy, the times of sadness. And so I want to thank every single one of you for being here. I want to say a special thank you to all the young people um, that are here today. And maybe part of the problem is our fault as adults. But we don't tell you enough how much we love you and how important you are and how much your God loves you and how his son Jesus died for you. You're valuable. You're needed. You're wanted. And you can and will make a difference. And to the parents, we thank you for your courage. It's not easy to raise a child, but let me tell you, you definitely can't do it alone. And to the church here at Robert Still, you're absolutely beautiful. Thank you for your love. And thank you for the way you've shown such great unselfish compassion to Brian and Susan. Because if anyone's worth it, they are. And so today, we're not only here to grieve over the loss of Reese, but to give thanks to God for his life among us. We're here not just to mourn about how different our life is going to be without Reese, but to remember how full life was when Reese was here in our midst. Reese's life and death have changed us, and none of us are ever going to be the same. But if you cling to the shepherd, God will give you new mercies and new strength every day to carry on. God's power can deliver you, if you allow it, to a brand new day. And so remember the good times. Remember Reese's love, his care, his joy, and his smile. Don't forget to give thanks for the beautiful gift of life that he gave. Lean on God, for God is strong. And he is able to carry you through this day and bring you to places of new light, new mercy, and new hope. At this time, one of the deacons at Robert Sell Church Christ, Dana Wilcox, is going to come up and he's going to lead us in a prayer. And after that prayer, you'll be dismissed. Thank you all for being here today. Let's all pray together as a big family. Father God, thank you so very much for this celebration of Reese's life. It was absolutely a celebration. God, the way that the testimony of the people, the friends, the family, the community that came forward, shared in Reese's life, it was just so evident, God, the smile that he had, the wittiness, the way he lit up a room as he came in, God. Father, we just, we just want to remember that forever. He touched so many lives, God, and we thank you so much for using him to do so. You may carry that on. And God, we, um, we just pray that we as a church, a community, friends, and of course you, God, wrap your arms around the Johnsons, especially uh, Susan and Brian, and the most, one of the most God-fearing people I've ever met. I thank you for putting them in our life. God, I just pray that we will always be there for them, no matter what it is. And we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>